If your giant shape-shifting pet crow started terrorizing the neighborhood, what would you do? What began as a simple act of mercy now threatens to tear apart our entire family, assuming our clinically narcissistic mother doesn't do it first. And to make matters worse, this thing looks more like us with each passing day. So you know we'll be catching the blame for all its violent tendencies. Let's hope someone in this family has the nerve to shut this chick up and also get rid of the monster. I'm going to break down the mistakes made what you should do and how to beat the angry bird in hatching. Tina is an aspiring gymnast and like many athletes in her field, no one's more excited about it than the overbearing parent that forced it on her in the first place. And here she comes now. Oh great, a blogger mom. Brace yourselves for a totally unscripted look behind the scenes of their humble home. You can tell they love each other by all the tickling. It's a dead giveaway. Look, even her dispassionate low T husband husband is getting in on the fun. Then again, it's probably the most action he's seen in years. Truly, this is the idyllic Finnish home life Simo Haya and Lori Torney were thinking of while helping all those red commie ba- to an early grave. Obviously, I'm joking. The sight of family photos being taken via selfie stick makes me wish for a sudden cameo from Art the Clown. Serial killers aside, is there anything that could possibly ruin this disgustingly wholesome, candid, or planned family moment? Hmm, how about reality? A sudden thump on the window prompts Tina to investigate, unwittingly clearing the way for a visit from none other than the Rick James of Crows. Jesus, it's like the scroll scene from Christmas Vacation, and they're just like the Griswolds. Of course, in either case, the same pragmatic solution still applies. They just need a hammer. Catch it in the coat. Smack it with a hammer. Looks like Tinia's got it covered. Well, the first half anyway. Good thing mom's around with her caring maternal sensitivity. That'll teach him for compromising her hyper-idealized social media presence. And not a moment too soon. The way that chandelier was fastened, this thing could have very well brought down the entire house. Oh, well, it's over now. Or is it? That night, as Tinia lies awake thinking about the childhood she could have had, were she born into a less neurotic household, the distant cawing of a crow drags her out of bed to check the comp post bin where she last saw the intruder. Only, he's gone. Yeah, it was probably just stray cats or a common raccoon dog that made off with the bird, but sure, this definitely warrants a stroll through the pitch dark evil dead forest at night. Let's rewind for a second. You know what I see here? I see a pair of overprotective parents who deliberately sheltered their children from the grim realities of existence to such an extent that they're not only soft, but also completely lacking in the mental faculties required to grasp the potential dark consequences of their actions, much less deal with them. The outcome? Their tweenaged daughter is chasing the cries of a wounded sky rat at 2 o'clock in the morning. This is why you should read your kids Lovecraft and Solzhenitsyn before bed and gradually expose them to greater and greater degrees of the macabre, lest they wind up full-blown adult babies like Charlotte from the Seed. Let the impending show serve as a stark warning to all those who would deny this notion. Hold up, which of you nerds actually prepares and cooks your own meals. I'm not talking about PB&Js. I'm talking about steaks, seafood, fruits, vegetables, the good stuff. If that's you, then you need to check out this video's sponsor, Kamikoto. It's all about the tools for the job. Here we have the Kempeki knife set, which includes the 7-inch Nakiri vegetable knife, 8.5-inch slicing knife, 5-inch utility knife, 7-inch Santoku multi-use knife, and Chukabocho, and a Toishi whetstone to keep those edges sharp enough to slice and dice. These are the same knives used by Michelin star chefs all over the world. It's almost criminal that plebs in their studio kitchens have access to this tier one cutlery. Will it make up for your lack of chefing skill? Yes. As we all know, the gear makes the operator. The Gucciier your gear, the more operator you are. With Kamikoto's knives being made from high quality Japanese steel using traditional techniques, they're pretty Gucci. Each knife is individually inspected for greatness and comes with a lifetime guarantee. Lifetime. That's a lot of chopped meat if you run the numbers. The knives come in a heavy-duty ash wood box, which makes it a great present, especially with Christmas coming up. They're also great for storing your blades after you make a mess of your meat. Kamikoto is running a massive Black Friday sale right now, and is offering my viewers an extra $50 off any purchase with the discount code NERDEXPLAINS. Go to kamikoto.com slash NERDEXPLAINS and help support the channel. Eventually, Tina hones in on the source of the squawking. Well, this ought to be good. What is she gonna do? Swaddle it up with her cardigan and sing it to sleep. Oh, 
Okay, I'll admit, the girl's got a little bit more grit than I anticipated. Now, if only she had the brains to match. I mean, come on, do you really think an egg that big came out of a crow? Although, it would certainly explain all the screeching. Regardless, I'm not saying of wanting to save the baby crow you just orphaned, a la Cain and Abel is exceptionally brain dead, it's just really weird and pathetic. But it's our future decisions regarding the egg I'm referring to. I mean, you all saw the thumbnail, right? The next day, Tina runs home from gymnastics practice just in time to catch her mom giving the repairman a helping hand. I guess that serves her sissy soft husband right for spending all day at work to provide for their family. That said, you gotta admire Giga Chad's grift. Nothing like a ladder and toolbox to ward off suspicion when you need to make a hot exfil after an even hotter infill. Too bad her desperate housewife failed to take any precautions whatsoever. If you're gonna have an affair, at least show your loved ones some respect and set up a ring doorbell with notification tones. Shortly thereafter, Mother of the Year comes up to Tina's room to buy her silence with a brand new bedazzled leotard. Nothing to worry about, sweetheart. Sometimes mommies and daddies have special friends they grope in the living room. No, really, that's actually what she's going with here. Jesus, lady, your daughter's dense, but not that dense. Besides, as fast and loose as she's been with playing this infidelity, the old man has to know something's up. Sure, keep strumming that six string, Santana. Meanwhile, Taro's sh**ing your wife while she's on her special seminar for Finnish family vloggers. You know, cause that market's just blowing up right now. And apparently, so is Tina's foster bird. I'm no ornithologist, but I'm pretty sure bird eggs don't continue to grow once they've been laid. And even if they do, there's no way it's by a thousand percent like that. Should probably show this thing to our parents before the velociraptor inside comes bursting out of Mr. Bear's chest like a z. Of course, if she's worried about Mother Dearest slinging it against the nearest brick wall, we could probably afford to wait until she leaves on another business trip and show it to Dad. Hmm, on second thought, we might be better off without his help. Alright, there's no reason to panic, yet. But even a kid should recognize whatever sloshing around in this thing is no ordinary crow, which should at least be enough to inspire a couple Google searches. And while we're at it, we might want to consider looking into symptoms of lead poisoning, because Tina's critical thinking skills are right about to take a complete nosedive. After a particularly brutal gymnastics lesson guest coached by Momzilla, Tina returns to her bedroom to compensate for her abhorrent lack of parental affection by doting over the freak egg, which, surprise surprise, is now bigger than her head. Oh, and it also glows when she touches it. Awesome. Yeah, this thing's starting to look like something I brought back from Hoxie's. Might be time to get Mother involved before it gets any bigger. After all, nothing pumps up those view numbers like a messy gender reveal. Combine that with an egg drop, and you've struck TikTok gold. I'm only half kidding. Well, okay, maybe like 10%. Regardless, I suppose a more appropriate, albeit infinitely less satisfying option would be to call Finland's Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry and have them take it from here. Remember, when we adopted this thing, we thought it was a crow. This is not a crow. We have no idea what living conditions and or feeding requirements it'll need to survive. And there's no point in saving its life just to watch it shrivel up and die on a diet of table scraps and the fact that we might be on its diet. Of course, this isn't even taking into consideration the paranormal sh for all we know, whatever comes out of this egg will be the worst thing to happen to Finland since Death Clock rewrote their national anthem. In that case, better it clacks off inside some government laboratory than one of our stuffed animals. A couple nights later, things get even worse when Tina's mom calls her into the room to confide that she's finally found love and happiness for the first time in her life. I repeat, she's telling her daughter that the best time of her life was spent in the arms of the handyman as opposed to... I don't know, something involving her two young children. Naturally, the poor girl is less than thrilled with this revelation, and the thought of her family coming apart at the seams sends her crying back to Egbert. And my, has he grown. What an utterly disgusting failure of parenting for your daughter's sole source of consolation to be a colossal bird egg. Not to mention the fact that she still hasn't thought to tell someone about it. See, this is the mind-numbingly awful decision-making I was talking about earlier. I mean, for Christ's sake, it's bigger than she is. Forget feeding this thing. How are you going to keep it from devouring your little brother when it's born the size of a timber wolf? Speaking of which, is that a crackling noise I hear? 
And it has hands. Great. As if a human-sized crow weren't bad enough. What's the matter, kiddo? Don't tell me you're starting to have second thoughts. Besides, what the hell were you expecting? The egg would just keep on growing until it eclipsed the sun and starved out all life on Earth? Oh, sure. Go ahead and curl up in the closet. After all, no sense in trying to warn your family about the five-foot-tall bird monstrosity you just unleashed on mankind. Better hope old Dad Halen doesn't pick tonight to actually do some parenting. Otherwise, his wife's boyfriend might just have to swing by and swap out the blood-stained wallpaper. Predictably, the creature's shrieks of abandonment finally draw some attention. However, instead of sticking around for its first meal, the feathered freak bolts through the bedroom window just as Dad's about to barge in. Lucky for Tina, it seems her brain hemorrhage is hereditary, as she's able to explain away the broken glass as just another bird getting in, which is technically true, but dude, look at this sh no wonder mom feels comfortable bringing her boy toy around the house. Old Four Eyes probably holds the door for him on his way to work. Anyway, if I were Tina, I wouldn't get too comfortable sitting on an empty nest. Something tells me we haven't seen the last of Big Bird. In the meantime, we should ask Dad to patch that hole with more than just a little cardboard. After all, this thing busted out that thick shell like it was paper mache. <sighs> What's the point? We all know Tina's gonna let that abomination back in the second it shows up. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. Huh. Looks like it didn't quite make it out unscathed. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? If it bleeds, we can kill it. That's right, Dutch. And by the looks of this thing's bony exterior, it wouldn't take more than a few smacks with a skillet. Of course, like we saw before, Tina's a real sucker for wounded animal noises. And against whatever trace amounts of better judgment she has rattling around up there, she rips the shard from Chicken Little's wrist. Yeah, as if it couldn't have done that with its other disgusting free can. If you ask me, this was all a desperate bid for attention, and we just fell for it hook, line, and sinker. Pretty soon, it'll start drawing on the walls and acting out at school every time it wants a hug. However, Tina doesn't stop there. Evidently, some minor bird surgery was all it took for her to go full Florence Nightingale for this thing, going as far as giving it a bath before singing it to sleep under her bed. So, yeah, I guess we're keeping it. Never mind the fact that it's the size of a 12-year-old and randomly screams at the top of its lungs. Then again, with our parents either away on business or shutting out reality with headphones, it could very well be weeks before either of them actually notice I'm being generous, of course. This is incredibly stupid. In fact, even adjusted for Tina's age, it's still got to be one of the dumbest decisions we've covered to date. Let me know in the comments if you can think of anything that might top it. The big question now is how long before something terrible happens? And it turns out the answer is immediately. Just ask the neighbor's French bulldog, Rusa. Oh, except you can't because Petey here ripped her head off last night. Well, that and she's a dog, but you get the idea. Boy, nothing like waking up beside the headless remains of someone's beloved pet to make you question your life decisions and sick to your stomach. <laughs> Nice, way to keep validating its bad behavior. Now this thing's gonna hack up a chunky boy whenever it starts feeling peckish. Now, at this point, a normal person might consider the broader implications of their pet dinosaur having slipped away in the dead of the night to decapitate their neighbor's dog. After all, if Bird Ferguson could do that to a Frenchie, what could it do to a toddler or even a small child? Of course, the kind of person that would ask these questions probably would have done something about the oil drum-sized bird egg incubating in their bedroom Room long before it ever hatched in the first place. Regardless, Tina better invest in a shovel because I got a feeling this is far from the only grave we're gonna be digging by the time this is over. Whatever number that may be, hopefully, it includes one for each of her criminally useless parents. Seriously though, it's only a matter of time before this thing hurts someone you really care about. And since this time around, E.T. doesn't have a home to phone, our only option is to get rid of it before that happens. I'm sure the nice G-Men will probably just take Beaky buzzard to a big farm upstate where it and all God's other mistakes can run around and play. Besides, there's bound to be some kind of reward, be it cash or notoriety. That goes along with making all the world's biologists their collective pants. Nah, who am I kidding? We all know Tina's sole source of motivation is love which, as we've seen, is in pretty short supply in this dump. And apparently, she's not the only one that feels that way. I mean, at least she can leverage the knowledge of her mother's extracurricular activities to at least get her hair brushed once in a while. Poor little Ralphie might as well be invisible around here. That is, until he plops Fido's carcass down on the coffee table like he just pulled a bank job. 
Unfortunately for the little super sleuth, neither of his parents are willing to believe the daughter is going around hacking up people's pets all willy-nilly. Because why the hell would they? Sucks to suck, nerd. Next time, bring the receipts. Or catch your mom in the throes of passion with her secret lover. Naturally, this little publicity stunt lands Ralphie in hot water, especially after taking out his frustration on the golden child. However, instead of going straight to his room as directed, he takes a detour through Tina's room to investigate a mysterious shadow lurking behind the door. I sure hope you brought more than your red rider with you, kid, because it turns out they were lying about the monster under the bed. Talk about a close shave. Good luck ever sleeping again. Oh, huh? well, serves the runt right for tattling. It's just like the rhyme says, snitches get mauled by bird monsters. He's just lucky the beast let him off with just a warning. Although, I'd still probably GTFO immediately in case it was gearing up for round two. Meanwhile, back downstairs, it seems that hard knock on the carpet really did Tina's head in, as she hasn't stopped spazzing out since the little bro left. Don't worry though, it turns out all she needed was a quick slap to the face. Great work, Dr. Mom. Hey, quick question for all you parents out there. Your daughter just hit her head before launching into what can only be described as a grand mal seizure. Oh, and now she's seemingly shouting at herself while alone in her bedroom. Would you, A, take her to the hospital immediately, or B, completely ignore all of this and instead freak out about the ripped up leotard in her closet? Just curious. On the subject of criminal negligence, Tina's precious little freak show has just crossed the line into lashing out at a human being, her little brother no less. Sure, it wasn't exactly an unprovoked attack. But you gotta believe this isn't the last time that brat might go snooping around in her bedroom. Hmm, on second thought, it very well might be. Either way, you won't always be able to control who's going in and out of your room. At this point, I gotta wonder if Little Miss Mensa isn't legit hoping Zapdos rips someone's face off. And while I can totally see why that might be, there's still no telling if that face might be hers. Whether driven by malicious intent or straight up simple jack levels of stupidity, Tina continues sheltering, feeding, and even clothing her feathered friend. She even names the damn thing, and you know what that means. 100 out of 100% chance she's gonna simp for this monstrosity when the chips are down. It's Mr. French from Cold Skin all over again. Meanwhile, she makes absolutely zero effort to keep this alley, as she calls it, locked down overnight. Instead, allowing it to free roam the house and scare the shit out of her family members whenever it wants. Never mind what happened the last time Allie got out. At this rate, you're liable to wake up one morning to find it roasting on a spit in the backyard. Then again, it seems mom poses more of a threat to herself and her children than she does an intruder. She's not the only one, kid, believe me. What Ralphie is noticing is the fact that Allie is starting to take on more and more of Tina's physical characteristics. You know, like her long blonde hair and huge razor sharp beak. I mean, sure, it probably won't be winning any beauty pageants in the near future, but as fast as these changes are happening, it stands to reason Allie might soon look completely different, which isn't exactly a bad thing. I mean, my God, talk about a face only a mother could love. Eventually, things start getting spicy after gymnastics practice practice one day, when Tina learns her friend Rita is slated to take their team's last remaining slot in the upcoming competition. Although the way mom so lovingly rubs salt in the wound doesn't exactly help the situation. Somehow this information is instantly relayed back to Allie, who promptly decides to take matters into its own claws. Man, looks like Tina isn't the only one with a lousy home life. Who the heck? lets their frail 12-year-old daughter walk home alone down a long, dark forest road at night. Oh, well, I'm sure they'll learn their lesson after this happens. Still probably not the worst thing she could have run into. Just saying. Just like the other day, Tina starts freaking out during the attack. But once again, her mom's able to bring her back to reality before she swallows her own tongue. However, despite the fact that she's going through some serious sh right now, the way mom sees it, it's all just nerves leading up to her big day. And she has just the answer. Getting out of the house for a weekend of mother-daughter bonding at her boyfriend's house. After all, nothing calms the nerves quite like a front row seat to the slow burn dissolution of your new Clear family. God damn. This lady's got no shame. First, she overtly bribes her daughter into silence with a gift that's really more about her reliving her glory days as a skater than anything else. Then, she has the nerve to pull the poor girl even deeper into the situation by gushing over Taro like they're friggin' Gilmore girls. And now, she's dragging her off to the man's house, which, let's be real, is probably her way of killing two birds with one stone by allowing her greater control over Tina's gymnastics training while also shacking up for the weekend. Bundle up, 
fellas, it is cold out there. Upon getting home, Tina immediately runs up to her room in search of Ali. However, aside from the mucus-covered beak lying in her closet, there's no sign of the foul creature anywhere. Well, this certainly doesn't look good. Then again, maybe the dirty bird has finally flown the coop. <laughs> Nah, I'm just kidding. There's no way we've seen the last of this thing. I'm sure it won't be long before it comes back to make her life a living hell when we least expect it. That said, maybe getting away from the house isn't such a bad idea after all. You know, right up until Allie shows up expecting our puke sickle and savagely tears our dad and brother limb from limb in a fit of violent rage. This is pretty much Tina's last chance to do the right thing. We need to put her foot down and tell mom we won't be coming along to listen to her and Taro play mattress tag all weekend. Oh, wait, I forgot. In a in addition to being incredibly stupid, this girl is also incredibly spineless, so there's basically no chance of that happening. Still, we could try and fake some kind of illness the day of. I highly doubt she'd be willing to let a sick child interfere with her important business. Oh, and about that, yeah, no need disguising it anymore. It turns out, Dad is well aware of the whole situation, and boy does he just sound thrilled. My god. Yeah, on second thought, let's get out of here. This guy deserves to wind up bird food. Jesus Christ, at this point, it's hard to say who's a bigger blight on humanity, Tina's mom or the bird thing. Either way, here's hoping Tarot's got what it takes to put them both in the dirt with his old Finnish Mosin before the claws sink in too deep. After a long drive into the countryside, Tina and her mother arrive at the dilapidated fixer-upper Tarot calls home. Hmm, looks like he has a particular affinity for damaged goods. Once inside, mom launches into a detailed tour culminating in the nursery, where we meet the handyman's infant daughter, Helmy. And by the looks of it, the missus has really taken a liking to the little cue ball. Cute kid. Sure would be a shame if someone in here were unwittingly transmitting the green light codes to their telepathic murder bird. Eventually, nighttime rolls around, and Jesus Christ, how on earth was this trip supposed to help Tina relax? Between baby Helmy's near perpetual shrieking and the constant creaking of bed springs, this might as well be a Motel 6. But just when things Things couldn't possibly get any worse. Here comes everyone's favorite eyesore. God, the face. Looks like it got hit with a guitar solo. I can't believe I'm saying this, but this thing looked a lot better when it hatched. Horrible ugliness aside, this is yet another in the sky-high heap of red flags Tina's too colorblind to comprehend. Unless this thing pulled a Cape Fear the whole way over, it would be nigh impossible for it to have tracked us down. That is, unless it had some kind of mind-link powers, as was suggested by Tina flipping out during each of the attacks. Okay, I mean, obviously that's gonna be the last thing she or even an intelligent person might think of. But honestly, what else could it be? GPS? Ultimately, it doesn't matter because our little heroine doesn't even think twice before letting it in for a face-to-face -face snuggle sesh. Granted, the alternative probably involved Allie coming completely unglued and smashing its way in all the same. The next morning over breakfast, things finally start looking up. Yeah, sure, there's an unpredictable hominid monster lurking nearby that could attack at any second, but look at how much fun Taro is. Duke doesn't even beat her with a phone book when she stains the tablecloth. For real, though, he does actually seem like a nice guy. All right, that's enough of that. Back to the eternal suffering born of Tina's foolish actions. Mom gets a phone call from someone bearing some pretty heavy news. And before long, the two of them arrive at the hospital where young Rita is in rough shape. Man, what a way to land a spot in the competition. Actually, hang on. A second. It's just some deep scratches on her face. She might still be able to... Oh, oh, no. Her hand's gone. Yeah, she'd probably just put some flowers down and leave. Something tells me she's not in a talking mood. <laughs> See, yeah, I didn't think so. Well, aside from clearing space on the team roster as mom so gleefully mentions, the good news is that it seems Tina's finally figured out how this thing works. Apparently, it's some kind of Corsican brothers soul bonding deal, wherein she and Allie share sensory information remotely. And while it's unclear how we might be able to leverage this to keep our other half in check, we at least have some kind of early warning system for when it's about to do something terrible. A little while later, Tina returns to her room at Taro's house and really gives Allie the business for slashing up her friend. Yeah, the phrase stop hitting yourself comes to mind, but I can hardly blame her for not wanting to touch that thing. That said, if it can feel her pain from a distance, I'm not sure why Tina would stand right next to it where it could restrain her. I mean, just as long as it gets the idea, right? Of course, the fact that this works brings up another problem. What would happen if Allie were to say, get shot in the mouth with a rifle? Would Tina's head also explode? Or would she just walk away with the world's worst migraine? I mean, if it were 
up to me, I'd say we should take the shot and see what happens to her. But I can see why she might not want to go playing rough roulette with a double-barreled shotgun. Whatever she does, it better be quick, because it seems Allie's finally completed its transformation. Gee, I can hardly wait for the obligatory shoot her, no her conundrum this leads to. If I were Tina, I'd head this off now by either cutting Allie's hair super short, or even dyeing it to another color if we can find the means. Otherwise, we're pretty much asking for a tragic case of mistaken identity. You know, like the one that's right about to happen. The next day, while Mom is out, Taro overhears Tina whipping up a breakfast Bowl and goes to check on her, which brings us to this little shit show. <laughs> Not so handy now, are ya? For real though, he's lucky he just got off with the bloody knuckles. That said, the real miracle here is the fact that he didn't realize the little girl holding the door and the one hunched over like the exorcist couldn't possibly be one in the same. Regardless, he spent enough time around Tina's mother to learn to tolerate a certain degree of insanity, and as a result, is quick to want to forgive and forget. Although, I highly doubt he'll be asking her to babysit anytime soon. Now, given she's seen firsthand just how aggressive Allie can be if discovered by an unwitting third party, you might expect her to actually take some degree of responsibility for the ticking time bomb she brought into the world. Of course, if that's what you're really expecting, then you must be watching a completely different movie than I am, because everything I've seen so far indicates she'll probably just head on off to her gymnastics competition without taking as much as the slightest precaution to keep Pidgeotto from tearing apart the wounded man and his baby. And what do you know? That's exactly what she does. Over at the gymnasium, Tina finally gets her time to shine. However, as she's approaching the bars, she's suddenly overcome by the feeling something really bad's about to happen. And that can only mean one thing. With the entire crowd watching, she takes both a literal and figurative dive, knowing that the impact of hitting the mat will at least be enough to stop Allie in her tracks. And sure enough, she was right. <sighs> Not a moment too soon. Baby Helmy was just about to get the axe. Unfortunately, this move doesn't come fast enough to keep Taro from spotting Allie as it makes its escape. And upon finding the hand axe, it doesn't take him long to piece together what almost just went down. Now, if only he were smart enough to realize Tina couldn't possibly have been both at the gymnastics competition and his daughter's nursery at the same time. But oh well, at the very least, he's got the requisite number of brain cells to tell both Tina and her mom to f*** right off when they get back. I mean, sure, his timetable's a little off, but the dude nearly walked in on a real-life dead baby joke. I think he's allowed a freebie. And besides, this weird crap only started once his boo thing's emotionally traumatized daughter showed up. Whatever's going on, it stands to reason that she's somehow involved. While we may have burned that bridge for good, the whole experience has taught us a valuable lesson we can use to keep the beast at bay. Not only did we correctly identify that Allie was up to no good, but we were also able to stop her from following through using some good old-fashioned pain compliance. It's not a permanent solution, for sure, but it'll at least allow us to keep our doppelganger in line while we figure out a way to end this madness once and for all. We just need to get our hands on something that can inflict a significant amount of pain without doing any serious damage. A stun gun comes to mind, but since we're limited to the things a 12-year-old can acquire, we might have to resort to slapping ourselves in the face or ripping off band-aids like an Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Fortunately, Mom seems to be well-versed in this matter. <laughs> Evidently, losing her boyfriend and her shot at vicariously reclaiming her former glory all in the same day is more than she can handle. After what could only have been a long and very, very, very awkward drive, the two arrive back home just in time for mom to immediately start love bombing her pathetic doormat husband. However, it turns out they're not the only ones who made it home. God damn, that freak can move. Either it was hanging onto the car, or its father must have been the roadrunner. Whatever the case, it seems Ellie's finally managed to wear out her welcome, and all it had to do was murder a dog, almost rip Ralphie's face in half, mutilate a little girl, and nearly hack up a baby with a hand axe. Truly, life is unfair. Speaking of which, Mom realizes she still needs her daughter for the follow-up video addressing what went down during the livestream of her gymnastics competition, once she's properly dressed, of course. Desperate to win back even the smallest shred of maternal affection, Tina dutifully works on getting camera ready, when all of a sudden her spidey senses start tingling again. 
not a moment too soon. By the looks of it, Allie was about two seconds away from snuggling her mom's head off. What a shame she only just found out about her daughter's feral Flash clone once things started to fall apart. I mean, just think about how many more views she could have milked out of her family with a pair of identical twins. What a massive missed opportunity, especially since Allie reacts to the sudden use of negative reinforcement by immediately dislocating its own jaw. Yeah, no amount of filters is gonna fix that. Having temporarily chased the threat away, Tina is finally able to explain to her mother the real reason behind all the bizarre goings on of late. <laughs> I hatched it? I'm sorry, are we really gonna act like that's a reasonable explanation for this fucking insanity? Huh, well, apparently so. Luckily, if there's anything mom knows like the back of her hand, it's killing troublesome birds that threaten her vlogging operations. And the best part for Tina is that they can do it together. It'll be just like getting their nails done. After arming up with a pair of kitchen knives, the mother-daughter duo heads back upstairs for what might be the single most calm and effective communication of a dire situation ever witnessed in a horror movie. Joku. Se näyttää ihan tinjalta. Se ei ole tinja. Kaikki. Then again, by now the broken man probably knows better than to question her. She probably could have said anything and he would have reacted the exact same way. Now, ordinarily, I'd say the two adults should be the ones to put themselves in harm's way. But yeah, I think it's safe to say the two most capable people in the house are on the case. Besides, Tina pretty much serves as the ultimate hunting dog. Think about it. Using her mind to link connection with Allie, she can slap or pinch herself to make their prey cry out in pain and reveal its position. I'd say that's a pretty good reason to keep her around. Well, that and the fact that this thing they're hunting looks almost exactly like her. Yeah, whatever. You know they're gonna split up immediately. After all, having only one of the twins on screen at a time saves on editing costs. Of course, this can only mean one thing. That's right. Allie's gonna tackle mom to the ground and knock the knife away so we can get this little money maker for the trailer. There we go. Yep, you can go ahead and stab her now. <laughs> Damn, mom's kind of savage. It's not over yet, though. There's still the matter of the coup de grace, but because it's gone more than five seconds without trying to murder someone, Tina pretty much completely forgets why they're ever hunting this freak show down in the first place. Oh, God. And there go the d wounded animal noises again. You know she can't resist those. I think I know what we're all thinking here. Mom needs to force Tina to put this thing out of its misery. It's the same kind of exposure I was talking about earlier. Otherwise, she's gonna spend the rest of her life getting held back by miserable and destructive people just because she feels sorry for them. It's time to cut the dead weight. But as the saying goes, if you want something done right, you'd better do it yourself. And instead of using the opportunity to change your daughter's life for the better, she takes aim with her blade and swings it with all their might. Directly into... Wait, fuck. Tina? Oh my god, you gotta be kidding me. She really ninja'd her way in front of the knife, the split second before it struck. Well, as long as she doesn't pull it back out. God damn. Are you actually trying to kill her? Because that's definitely how you do it. Oh, but it gets even better. Because as soon as Tina slumps over dead, some of her blood drains into Allie's open mouth. And wouldn't you know it, it's not only completely healed by this, but now it freaking talks. Unbelievable. We were this close to ridding the world of yet another human-animal abomination. And once again, some bleeding heart has to get in our way. On the positive side, she at least had the decency to die and spare the world from any more bird people she might have otherwise nurtured into being. You'd better believe mom is gonna have this thing house trained so she can pass it off as Tina to keep her vlog show rolling. I mean, you know the dad isn't gonna stop her. In the end, only Tina actually bought the farm. Although, it's hard to say whether Allie will try to take her place or just butcher them all alive as soon as the credits roll. Either way, it doesn't take a genius to realize nothing good could come from hatching an egg the size of a go-kart, much less harboring whatever feathered freakazoid crawls out of it. At any time, a reasonable person could have and should have revealed this discovery to the the proper authorities, at which point it would almost certainly be captured and killed before winning some science nerd a Nobel Prize. For that reason, I think hatching was beaten. Moral of the story, eggs are for omelets.